Middle East bread. I got oil well money in the desert playing golf. All right, back on the Young Turks. Look, I'm going to have to save the conversation about how different TV and TYT are for the post game, right? We've had that a little bit in the past. I got more info on that. We'll do that for the members. It's a long and interesting conversation. Uh, but let me just say that I, I did a whole week, right? And I got too used to it. Like when I first came on here, I don't know if you guys can, I don't think you can tell, I don't think so, but I came on, I was like, where's the script? <laughs> I was like, wait, no, because, and everything is so script, scripted and so tight, right? Now I get to write what's in the prompter, so don't, you know, there's no somebody telling me what to do, right? But I got used to it after a week and I'm like, oh, this show just started, I'm just, I guess I'm going to speak. <laughs> But this feels so much, I feel freer. I, I feel like I'm really talking to you guys. Oh, I love this. Anyway, so now let's get to it, man. Uh, let's expose them for what they are. So we're going to talk about the Republicans, their leadership, what they plan to do with Social Security, but also stretches in the conservative Democrats. And then I'm going to tell you the reality about Social Security. And I'm going to tell you the reality of what's happening in the middle class in this country. Okay. So first, let's start on Meet the Press. Uh, John Boehner and Mike Pence are going to go on, both Republican leaders, and uh, they're going to explain their thoughts on what should be done with Social Security. And as you're going to be able to tell from this clip, it's very simple code words for, let's cut it. Let's watch. All right. Well, you, one of the ways you talk about getting your arms around the spending was something that you suggested back in June, and that is that Social Security... Uh, the retirement age ought to be raised to the age of 70. Is that something that the GOP will campaign on in the fall? Well, David, I think it's time for the American people to have an adult conversation about the problems that we face. Uh, these entitlement programs serve tens of millions of Americans, and they're critically important. But we also know uh, that these programs uh, are unsustainable in their current form. And I really do think it's time. Uh, that we sit down and we talk to the American people together about how we solve them. And I think we need to bring Democrats and Republicans together uh, in order to solve this problem. And so you favor raising the retirement age? David, there are a lot of options about how you solve these. Uh, but I don't want to get the cart before the horse. I think it's important to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a difficult conversation, uh, but it's time to have it and it's time to come up with some solutions uh, that are done in a bipartisan way uh, to help address these problems. Interesting that, majority, that the minority leader, Boehner, opened the door on the retirement age. That mm. was a very big opening and one that, that uh, I don't know if Congressman Pence agrees with it because some Republicans may want, not want to follow the leader down that do, road. Do you agree with that? Should it be raised to 70? Look, I, I, think, I think it is absolutely imperative uh, that, we, that we address all of the federal budget and have, and I like Harold's com comment, we, we miss Democrats like Harold on Capitol Hill these days, it, it, have an adult conversation about domestic spending and about entitlements. Well, we, but we keep talking about all these adult conversations. It's a, it's a narrow question, which is yeah. you're either for raising the retirement age or you're not. You can have a, a childlike yeah. conversation about it and just say whether you're for it or not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> look, look, I'm, I am for reforming uh, our uh, public entitlements for Americans who are far away from retirement. All right, you understand what's happening there? They're coming for your Social Security because that's the last big piggy bank. So, hey, if they got to make you work longer, who cares? They say maybe we'll leave it in place for really old people that are about to get retired. But if you're a young person and you've been paying that payroll tax and you've been paying into Social Security and Medicare all this time, <laughs> yeah, we're not going to give you that money. We're going to rob you. We're going to rob you blind. But they're so cocky and arrogant these days, they're just saying it. Before, they tried to do it on the sly without letting people know what was going on. But now Boehner's coming out and saying, yeah, I'm glowing orange, and I'm going to make you work till 70. Okay, now, if Social Security's in that kind of bad shape, well, I'm sure the numbers must bear that out. So in 2009, for example, Social Security must have lost a lot of money, right? Because it's going bankrupt, it's going bankrupt. Huh, that's weird. Look at this. In 2009, it turns out Social Security actually had a surplus of $122 billion. Well, you look at that. That went up $122 billion. That should say uh, in 2009, guys. Um, so that's last year. It went up. That's fascinating. All right. Well, 
It might have went up last year, but overall, it can't possibly have a surplus, right? It's about to go broke. You want to know what the overall surplus for Social Security is for the whole fund? $2.5 trillion. Okay, $2.5 trillion. Who's going broke? What are you talking about? Broke how? But now you say, wait a minute, now why is everybody in Washington in a panic then, right? That's because they're saying, oh, you know what, we already spent that money. Now, theoretically, we owe you that money because it's an entitlement. Oh, you think you're entitled to it because you already put it in, right? You already paid your taxes on it, you're supposed to get it back now. But you know what, we already spent it on tax cuts for the rich. We already spent it on wars. We already spent it on all this garbage uh, that wound up helping, as I'm about to show you, the upper class, but that didn't help the middle class. Now we don't want to give you the money because that, that $2.5 trillion doesn't exist. Now wait a minute. That, that's supposed to have the full faith and credit of the United States government. If you said to anybody in Washington, hey, let's just not pay our bill to China or to Saudi Arabia, they'd go nuts. they say, no, that's going to ruin our rating. It's going to destroy our currency. But these guys with a straight face come and say, let's not pay our bill that we owe the American middle class. And everybody goes, oh, that's interesting. OK, maybe we shouldn't pay the American middle class money they already put into the system. Oh, hell no. Hell no. In fact, if they ask me, can you touch Social Security, I got one answer, one answer only for them. Hell no, you can't. Ironic. That's from the glowing orange man. All right. Now, uh, let me give you a sense of, OK, is Social Security ever going to run into trouble? Yes, it could. Now, it depends on how, things, uh, how the economy does going forward. But right now, it's projected to run out of that surplus. So it must be any day now, right? OK, it's doing well now. But it's, since everybody's in a panic, it's probably going to run out in 2012, right? Or maybe 2020. Nope. The surplus doesn't run out until 2037. The surplus does not run out until 2037. Okay, so what's the panic about today? Well, you know what? Uh, to be fair, though, between 2037 and 2086, you'd only be getting 78% of your benefits if nothing changed at all. Now, does that sound like we need to just panic? cut your uh, benefits, make you work five years longer than we originally promised you? Because between 2037 and 2086, you might only get 78% of your benefits? This ain't about that, man. It's about taking more money from the middle class and funneling it to the upper classes. They already got their tax cuts. Last decade, record tax cuts for the top 2% of the country. By the way, how do they do? Well, let's take a look at that. Over the last 10 years, the top uh, 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 earners in the country, you know what they got? They got a 281% increase in their earnings, okay? You know what that equals? $973,000 per household. That's the top 1% of the country. So how do the top 1% of the country do as they're telling us Social Security is bankrupt, Medicare is bankrupt, et cetera, which isn't true? How did the top 1% do? They did fantastic. They raked it in. Nearly a million dollars per household. All right, now I got more stats on that top 5% versus top uh, bottom 80%. Now, top 5%, how do they do in terms of um, uh, income, right? So let's take a look at that. Hey, so give me my uh, 2009 numbers. Let's see uh, how they did there. Now, top 5% of Americans now have 37% of all consumer outlays. They have so much money that of all the consumer outlays, they're 37% of the market. For, to give you a sense of perspective, let's go to the 1990 numbers. The 1990, top 5% only had 25% of the consumer outlays. So you see what happened in the last 20 years? They've got a hell of a lot more money, as the first chart showed you, and they're spending it more. So, you know, some of it is, goes to their savings, some of it goes to their spending, but now they get to spend a lot more than you because the, you don't have the money anymore. They do. Okay? Now, how do the bottom 80% compare? The bottom 80%, as far as consumer outlays is concerned, is 39.5%. So 1% spends 37% of the money, gets to spend 37% of the money. The bottom 80% spend equal and, almost an equal amount of 39.5%. 1% equals 80% of the country in how much money they spent. And you see what their numbers went up. They had a fantastic 2000, the, uh, the whole decade. As our economy was crashing, as we lost 8 million new jobs, 
out the window. Unemployment is a disaster. And part of the reason I show you those numbers is because that's why they don't get it in Washington and in New York. Because they're doing great. They're confounded. They're like, what is, what's everybody complaining about their economy for? My income went up 300%. Well, what's all the crying over, right? Oh, you know what? I wanted to go up 300% again. So why don't I just go take the middle class money? Why don't I just take their Social Security? And that's what they're going for. Obama's deficit commission now, 14 out of 18 people on that commission are so-called fiscal conservatives. They all agree with Boehner and Pence and the Republicans saying, oh, no, there's only one answer. We got to take that big piggy bank that you built up in Social Security and rob it so that that top 1% or that top 5% can rise even higher. And, uh, and, and the rest of you, good luck to you. We don't need you anymore. When they asked Pete Peterson, who runs the Social Security, he's the guy who runs the foundations, who wanted to put together the Deficit Commission in the first place, and, and runs all these uh, operations coming to take Social Security money. He's the one that keeps saying over and over, he's a billionaire, saying, oh, Social Security is going bankrupt. You better make sure that you cut the money from Social Security. Uh, when they ask him, hey, there's a huge loophole for hedge funds that are the richest people in the country, including your hedge fund. Why don't we charge you a reasonable tax rate instead of almost next to nothing that we charge you? He says, oh, no, 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 no. If you do that, there will be capital flight. The rich people will simply leave the country. <laughs> we don't need you anywhere anyway. We outsource your jobs to China and India and wherever else. And if you don't play by our rules, we'll leave the country. And where's the middle class going to go? You can't go anywhere. You're trapped here. So we can just keep taking your money. Look, I get to go longer here, so you get a sense of why I get frustrated. I, I, it's tough to do all that on television, right? But so when people say, oh, but Cenk, why are you frustrated at Obama? You see all these facts? You know who put together the beloved Pete Peterson's deficit commission that he's been fighting for so long to get? It wasn't a Republican president. It was a Barack Obama. Why did he do that? Why did he give Pete Peterson the deficit commission to come and rob us? All right, one more thing on this. And by the way, I should correct myself. I think in the middle of that, uh, I said uh, that t top... 1% uh, equals top 80% in, in spending. As you saw in the graphs yourself, it's actually top 5% equals top the bottom 80% in, almost in spending. Okay, so you, and by the way, one t other twist on that is that now that the top 5% spend so much money in consumer spending, they're turning around and arguing, hey, listen, uh, we have to be better for the top 5%. We have to give them more tax cuts because they're such an important part of our economy. They're the only ones who have money left, and they're the only ones spending. So they're more important. We need to give them more tax cuts. Okay, so now David Gregory, doing a very good job in this last week at the press, had John Boehner on, as you saw earlier. And he's going to ask him about tax cuts. And he really, you know, corners him here. And you can see very, very clearly that Boehner is not going to answer the question. So let's go to clip number nine. The only way we're going to get our economy going again and solve our budget problems uh, is to get the economy moving, get more people back to work so where they can care for their own families and uh, begin to expand the tax rules uh, to bring more revenue to the federal government. And what we have to do is we have to get our arms around the spending spree that's going on in Washington, D.C. But, Leader Boehner, I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're not, you're not being problem. responsive to a specific point, which is how can you be for cutting the deficit and also cutting taxes as well when they're not paid for. Listen, you can't raise taxes in the middle of a weak economy uh, without risking the double dip in this recession. Uh, President Obama's favorite Republican uh, economist, Mark Zandi, uh, came out uh, several weeks ago and made it clear that raising taxes uh, at this point in, in the economy is a very bad idea. But do you agree you that tax cuts cannot be paid for? Without a help. But tax cuts are not paid for. Is that correct? I am not for raising taxes on the American people in a soft economy. That's not the question, and Leader the Boehner. That the, the question is, wants to tax. are tax cuts paid for or not? Listen, what you're trying to do is get into this Washington game, uh, uh, and they're funny accounting over there. You cannot get the economy going again by raising taxes on those people who we expect uh, to create jobs in America and to get the economy going again. If we want to solve the budget problem, 
We've got to have a healthy economy, and we have to get our arms around the runaway spending that's going on in Washington, D.C. I, I just want to clarify this. I mean, I, I, if you, I'm relying on what Chairman Greenspan said, maybe if you're accusing him of funny Washington games. He says that tax cuts that aren't paid for uh, are, are not, they are not cutting the deficit, that they are not actually paid for, it's borrowed money. And so do you believe tax cuts pay for themselves or not? Uh, I do believe that uh, we've got to get more money in the hands of small businesses and American families to get our economy going again. And the only way to, to get that economy going again is to do that and to get our arms around the spending. <laughs> Boy, did he not want to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, oh, you know, there's funny accounting. You're the one doing the funny accounting. He's asking you a very simple question. If you don't pay for the tax cuts, isn't the deficit going to go up? And the answer is obvious. Of course it's going to go up. But he doesn't want to say that because he wants to pretend that he's for cutting the deficit while he gives giant tax cuts to the top 2% of the country. By the way, something that was not part of that conversation is Obama's already giving tax cuts to everyone outside of the top 2%. So what Boehner is doing is saying, I don't care what it does to the deficit, and I'm not going to answer your question, and yes, I'd be willing to destroy our deficit and increase our debt if it means giving giant tax cuts to the top 2% of the people in this country. Because that's who he works for. That's what Boehner's all about. That couldn't be any clearer from that interaction right there. And by the way... What's that thing on YouTube, Jared? Do you know what is it? Annoying Orange or something? Is, is, is Anna know? I don't know. Maybe I'm too old for these things. <laughs> yeah, I'm beginning to think you are too old for this <laughs> stuff. There's some thing called like uh, something Orange. I'm gonna look that up, <laughs> okay? Because that's our gonna be our new nickname for John Bain. I think it's Annoying Orange, but I could be wrong. Now people watching this live are tweeting away. It's Orange Tang or something. No, no. We could go, oh, Jake, how do you not know that? What are you, Ted Stevens? Okay, anyway, we'll look that up for you. We'll get uh, Boehner's new nickname for you when we return. Young yeah. All right, back on the Young Turks. L let me do one quick plug here. Uh, Podcastalley.com. Uh, That's where our podcast is. If you guys go vote on it, um, that jacks up our uh, rating, and then more people get to see it. So more and more people have been listening and watching our uh, podcast because of your voting. So that's fantastic. Spreads the word. So uh, do, uh, as they say, do progressivism, progressivism a favor and go for, for the Young Turks. And you know what? Jay Tomlinson helps us a tremendous amount and it has a great podcast, which he features us and other uh, left uh, talk show hosts. It's called Best of the Left. So Best of the Left and the Young Turks at podcastalley.com. Every vote helps. God bless. Go forward. I love this next story. Yes, yes. Uh, a JetBlue flight attendant named uh, Stephen uh, Slater lost his patience when his flight landed in New York City. So it was a flight with about 100 passengers. And uh, before uh, the people can get up and get their luggage, one woman decided she's going to get up anyway, and she's going to try to get her luggage from the overhead bin. Well, while she did that, she accidentally hit the flight attendant on the head. Right, mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, Stephen Slater told her to sit down, and she didn't listen, and she uh, tried to get her luggage anyway. Anyway, after she hit his head, he totally lost it, goes on the PA and starts cussing out all of the passengers. Then he runs to the back, grabs a few beers, opens the emergency chute, slides off the plane, all right, runs uh, all the way to the terminal, and then goes home. All right, now, the story only gets better. First off, that, that's his uh, picture of him from his MySpace page. Um, first off, w after the lady hit him in the head with her bags, mm -hmm. he's like, can I get an apology? And she like, says, go fuck yourself. And then she called him a mofo. Okay. <laughs> okay. No wonder he got frustrated. And he's right. been putting up with this bullshit for God knows how long, right? right? And right before he pulled the chute and slid down, he goes, oh, well, there goes 28 years. Who doesn't love this guy? I know. Okay. I know. So, I love that he went back and got some beers. Like, he went to the back of the plane, grabbed a few beers. He's like, all right, now I'll go out of here. No, Steven Slater is an American hero. They need to rehire him, okay? Now, of course, instead what happens is cops go chase his ass down. Right. Now, guys, you know what happened. There ain't no terrorism here. There ain't no problems, okay? But they had to go chase his ass down in Queens. Mm -hmm. And when they do, what, how'd they find him, man? Uh, it says that when they found him, he was uh, in the sexual in a sexual embrace with his partner. 
What, what, what does that, that mean? Have, what does that mean? And what does that have to do with anything with the story? I love this story. <laughs> the police, well, if he's in a sexual embrace with his partner, whoever that might be, I don't know what that means. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but whoever that is, well, then get the hell out. There ain't no emergency, okay? Get a man get time to put on a robe. What are you busting into his house and checking out his sexual embraces for? And besides, which, look, he probably got a little drunk from those beers he grabbed. <laughs> Okay, and does what you most wanted, guys do when they're drunk. Yeah, why get some loving. <laughs> get a little loving. Come, come on, what, what, what do we got to do to get Steven Slater rehired? I don't know. How much would Maybe. you love this guy on your plane if he's your, you know, flight attendant? But like, come on, Steve, let's go grab a beer. Yeah. No, no, no. I actually give him props for standing up to the abuse that he's probably been facing for the past 28 years. Like, you know, you go through that. When you're in a customer service job, you always have to deal with that whole customer is always right. They can act up. They can do whatever you want, but it doesn't matter. They're always right. No, get the hell out of here. You're not right. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite Anna moves. Get the hell out of here. Okay. And look, everybody feels this guy's pain. You know, these people are a pain in his ass the whole time. Right. You know, and then he's got to sit there and take it and bow his head day in and day right. out. Oh, customer's right. Customer's right. And one day he said, fuck it, somebody get me a beer at an emergency shoot, okay? <laughs> he threw it, by the way, he threw his luggage down first. And then he's like, whoop, here we go, and slid down there. It's one of the all-time great moves, man. <laughs> now, of course, he's being charged with second and fourth degree criminal mischief. First and second degree reckless endangerment. And criminal trespass in the third degree. Oh, come on, man. You know what I'm going to say. Let him go! Let him go! Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Comes out of the courthouse, pulls the chute, <laughs> grabs a couple of beers, <laughs> and slides out of the courthouse. All right, Steven Slater, a uh, new TYT hero. Mm -hmm. All right, we're very clear on that. What's next? Uh, Minnesota Viking safety Hussein Abdullah plans on fasting during his NFL training, which I think is going to be disastrous because isn't NFL training the hardest training in the world? I don't know about in the world, but it's pretty damn hard. Right. It's really hot out there, and they uh, are uh, working out all day long, mm -hmm. right? And that's what the training camp's all about. Uh, now, I have some personal experience with this because this is what I used to do. Uh, back when I was a Muslim, mm -hmm. I would sometimes fast. And, uh, and, and sometimes, especially when I was younger, that was during the, the summer. Mm -hmm. And I played high school football, and during the summer, we would have those tour days. So you'd have, you know, in the morning and in the afternoon, you're there the whole day, mm -hmm. and it's hot as all hell uh, in the East Coast, and I wouldn't drink any water, I wouldn't eat anything, and I'd play. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, terrible idea. Okay? Later uh, in college, uh, I did the same thing in rugby. So mm -hmm. I'd play a whole rugby game without having eaten anything the whole day, without drinking any water, and then I'd drink you any water or eat anything all the way until the sun sets. Disaster. <laughs> okay? Now, I never... It, I played fine, I never any, had any health problems, and I was trying to be observant, and I'd go to all the practices, because the Ramadan is a month, you gotta go a whole month, okay? Just can't eat during, uh, when the sun is up. You know, having been devout before, to some degree, I, you know, I wasn't devout, devout, I wasn't praying five times a day, etc. Mm -hmm. but I was trying to do this. I feel for him, man, and he's a young kid, and I'm like, all right, you know, I know you wanna do the right thing, and I know you got your faith. But boy, is it not worth it. Mm -hmm. And they say last year uh, it's that he, it slowed him down, and they didn't know what was wrong with him. And they come to find out that he's fasting. Now, you're going to jeopardize your NFL career to, be, you know, to make some money, donate to the mosque near Ground Zero, whatever. Okay, do it in some other way. But you're never going to talk sense into him. I, I just hope he makes it and he doesn't get cut. Well, yeah, we keep... Even, I don't, of course, these stories don't happen with the other ones. It happens in some high school situations. Some kids end up dying just from the two days. And then people complain or parents come and start suing the school for running kids so far. And that's just high school. So I'm sure they push them further when it comes to professional level. It's just, it's the same thing as the sauna thing. Like, let's just do it just to, I mean, of course, not just to do it. But you're doing it and you're putting yourself through extreme temperature. It's hot as hell, as everybody knows. Something's going to happen to the guy. And then now we're going to say, should we allow people to risk their own health over something like this? It's okay if you fast, but then you start ex ex exerting all your energy like this. And like I said, everybody, everybody that played football did it, man. It's, you feel like you're going to die anyway, even after you've been <laughs> drinking water all day. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it, man. But, uh, you know, Hakeem Olajuwon used to fast during the, uh, even during the NBA Finals. 
uh, if my recollection is right, because it depends on the time of year, because mm -hmm. they're on the lunar calendar and they walk. I, but I know he fasted uh, throughout the season, uh, whenever that uh, the month of Ramadan came. And look, there's, of course, something very admirable about it. But like being an agnostic now, I realize that it was all worthless, or at least from my perspective. So then you think back and you're like, well, why did I put myself through that kind of pain? In fact, after I stopped being a practicing Muslim, I tried to keep up uh, fasting two times a year, not the whole 30 days, that's mental, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're wasting a uh, one twelfth of your life because those days are shot, okay? All you think about is, when can I eat? When can I eat? You know me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do the show. I'd, be, I'd lose my mind. I'd be like, when can I eat? When do I eat? When do I eat? When do I eat? This is, the whole day, you're just trying to waste it. You're like, go, 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 go. And then, of course, it lasts so much longer. Right? Oh, yeah. It's a disaster on top of disaster. So as a person who cares about living life, I don't want to do that. But I thought do it two days. First I tried three, then two, then one. Just because I thought, you know, it's a cultural thing. It's mm -hmm. a tradition. And it's a good tradition because it reminds you what the poor go through. That's a significant upside. It reminds you uh, what a gift it is to have food, uh, you know, in your stomach and to be able to drink whatever you want, etc. <laughs> but I'm just too... I'm a grown ass man now, and I just can't do it, man. Mm -hmm. I, and I got maybe I'm it's weakness in me, but Ramadan comes around. I'm like tradition, culture. Somebody get me a cheesesteak. <laughs> so what are you gonna do? Anyway, all right. What's next? All right, uh, strippers in Ohio are protesting a particular church that has been protesting their place of work. Uh, so. People from the New Beginnings Ministries in Ohio have been protesting at the Foxhole Gentlemen's Club. And the strippers are tired of it because what they do is they use uh, forms of intimidation to uh, shoo away pr patrons of the strip club. They'll take pictures of the uh, patrons' car, license plate, post it up on the Internet. That way they're afraid to attend the strip club. No, no, it's terrible. It's, we covered this before. Sometimes they'll follow people that went into the strip club all the way back to their house. They'll tail their car. That is so beyond acceptable, My, I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. And the cops say, oh, no, they got freedom of speech rights. You ain't got no freedom of speech to follow me to my house. You followed me to my house, we're going to have trouble, son. Okay, You're going to have to figure out your rights afterwards. Okay, so th these people are messed up. So the strippers are like, oh, yeah, you're coming to our house? Mm -hmm. Guess what? We're coming to your house. And we have a video of it. We have a video uh, where a reporter interviewed a few of them. They're sitting outside of the church. Hear what they have to say. As long as it exists, we will not share territory with the devil. I absolutely refuse as a pastor to look away from that place as long as it exists. After years of the church picketing the strip club, the women who work there and the club owner have turned the tables. I have never seen anybody picket a church. We had Pastor Bill Dunphy and his uh, followers show up about four years ago in August, and uh, it's been continual harassment virtually every weekend since then. So as the church members arrive for Sunday morning services, they're met by the strippers. What it comes down to is this, is that in our, in our society, in the world, there's good and there's evil. There's right and there's wrong. There's light and there's darkness. And um, what we're dealing with right now, whenever you take a look at the strip club, it's evil. I don't think necessarily either one of us are good or evil. I think there's good and evil in everyone, whether you're re affiliated with the church or whether you're affiliated with the foxhole. It's worth every minute to lose all my hours of sleep just to come down here and protest what I believe in, my right to work where I want to work, without being judged or called names or harassed. Um, their presence, um, the Foxhole's presence out here has solidified our ministry. It's unified our ministry. Um, vision, uh, unity is born out of vision. Now all of a sudden the vision is one. It's, it's, it's a common vision that we have got to see this thing through to the end. All right, nice work by the Columbus Dispatch there. All right, so first off, I thought if the strippers are coming in front of the church, here's what's nearly guaranteed. Uh, the parishioners later, when no one's looking, will go to the strip club, right? <laughs> But now that I saw the strippers... Oh, disaster. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything, and I love them, and I'm on their side. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating, man. Columbus, mm -hmm. let's step it up a notch. <laughs> okay, we can do better. Come on. But anyway, I love them. Of course, and I look, evil and good is goofy talk, right? They say, well, evil, okay. What are you, George Bush, right? But there are bad guys and good guys, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to make it simpler. And people who follow other people to their house to judge them are the bad guys. People trying to make a living and who've had enough 
Those are the good guys, okay? And look, they, they got to pay their bills, they got families, etc. So stop harassing them. And I love that they're fighting back. One more thing. It's called the foxhole. I think that's a hilarious name for a strip club. I'm not sure I want to go, especially given the situation at hand. Mm -hmm. But I almost want to go to support them now. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason I'd be going. All right, let's go to the next story. All right. Uh, a Rialto, California strip club waitress is alleging that the police department there uh, engages in group sex while <laughs> they're while they're on the job we have a video report ab uh, about this story and it'll give you some more details about it and then i'm going to break it down i'm going to tell you who's right and who's wrong okay, okay let's watch new allegations are rocking the rialto police department rocking. a strip club employee has filed a claim against the department that includes allegations of group sex mm. rebecca hall is live in rialto with more rebecca well, Leela, this is the strip club where one worker claims Rialto police officers would come and sexually harass women. Now, several officers are being investigated, and that female worker is prepared to sue the city for allegedly allowing it. In a claim filed last week, 37-year-old Nancy Holtgrave alleges officers frequented the lounge, sometimes while on duty. She says some began hooking up with female workers at local restaurants, even at city-owned police buildings, where several officers and rhino workers would allegedly engage in group sex at times. Rialto police refused to discuss these claims. According to documents, though, Holtgrave began having a consensual sexual relationship with one officer named James Dobbs. After Dobbs apparently got her pregnant, Holtgrave says he began intimidating and threatening her and has refused to pay child support. Holtgrave's attorney says she even went to the police chief to ask for protection because she felt scared, but the claim states nothing was done. That is why Holtgrave is asking for no less than $500,000 in damages, saying the city of Rialto knew about this alleged abuse but did nothing to stop it. So the city has 45 days to either settle this claim or reject the claim. If the city rejects this claim, uh, Holtgrave's attorney says her client will move forward with a lawsuit and sue the city, the Rialto Police Department, and Officer Dobbs. Much more on this story coming up tonight at 6. For now, we are live in Rialto. I'm Rebecca Hall. We'll send it back to you guys in the studio. All right, Rebecca, thank you. All right. Uh, on the city and the police department. <laughs> Not guilty. Okay, come on. First of all, I love the local news. Mm -hmm. Right here behind me is Spearmint Rhinos, where the strippers are. Yeah, I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, what a great ad for, for Spearmint Rhino. <laughs> you can't get a better ad than that. Now, she's aggrieved mm -hmm. because the guy's not paying child uh, custody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that he's, she says he's intimidated. You want to have a case on that? God bless your heart. I don't know. Maybe he was. Maybe, maybe he's not paying. Makes sense. Go to court. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who's guilty or not guilty on that, right? Well, you got to get everybody else involved for. Okay? Right. That's basically blackmail, saying, hey, you know what? If you don't pay me, I'm going to tell everybody you guys are all going to strip clubs mm -hmm. and having group sex, right? And then the local news will say, there is a controversy rocking the police department. And that's what she's doing it for. And it's BS. So the cops went to a strip club. Not guilty. Maybe on duty. Not guilty. Okay? Hooked up with strippers. Not guilty. Okay? No, I, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. I have no problem with them going to strip clubs, having group sex. All of that is 100% fine with me. But what if they are doing it on duty? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, look, of course I'm more split on that. Right. Now, he, here's the situation. This is how I think about it. If they're going to strip club for four or five hours a, 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 a day, mm -hmm. oh, come on now. No, no, that's unacceptable. Mainly, not, you can go anywhere for five hours a day. You go back to your home, go to, you know, sit in your pool, mm -hmm. go to a donut shop. I'm going to say, no, you need to be at work, mm -hmm. right? But if they go to, on their lunch hour, they go to a strip club instead of going to Denny's, mm -hmm. let them go, let them go. Look, you know how we talked about how the mayor here in L.A. might have gotten in trouble for going to a Lakers game? No, if you're the mayor of L.A., you get to go to the Lakers game. If you're the mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, whoever it might be, you get to go to the Yankees games. And if you're a cop, you get to go to a strip club and hook up some, with some strippers. What's the point of being a cop if you can't do that? Right, I, but not when you're on duty. I'm against on-duty strip club visits. <laughs> no, I am, though. No, 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 it's a reason. Don't get me wrong. Your position is enormously mm -hmm. reasonable, okay? And I'm probably the bad guy here, but look, I, we get on cops a lot, right? 
the one they're tasing folks they shouldn't be tasing, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. As long as they're not beating somebody up that they're not supposed to be beating up or shooting someone uh, that they shouldn't shoot, and they go to a strip club, nobody gets hurt, man. Mm -hmm. I can live with it. I can live with it. Let them go. Let them go. Okay, but specifically about this case, I'm not buying anything she's saying. Right, no, and I agree with you on that. It totally sounds like she's uh, upset and angry that she doesn't have any child support and he's not taking care of the kid, so he, she wants to take this all out on everyone else. So she throws everybody under the bus. Right. Last thing on that. Think about why did she mention group sex? What's the relevance? Right. Right? How did, what does that have anything to do with on duty, not on duty, this, that? No, she just wanted to smear them. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? No, not buying it. Throw her ass out. Again, not on, uh, on the city charges, not the specific guy. Mm -hmm. He's not paying child custody. That's a whole different issue. All right, we got to take a break here. Everybody calm down and come back. Can you go to Netflix right now and get it? Hell no, you can't. That's the wrong audio. <laughs> of course you can. Don't be ridiculous. Netflix.com slash TYT. 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 All right, yeah. back on the Young Turks. I'm your host, Shane Huger. Jared Jackson's producing. Jesus Godoy is directing. Now, you know, I, I'm going to start with a random story. Uh, from time to time, I take on people's cultures. And, uh, you know, some people understand. Some people get offended. Uh, I've taken on the Saudis. I've taken on, you know, name the culture, and we've gone after it. Okay, I don't want to bother reoffending everybody by listing all of them, right? Uh, but uh, as people who watch this show and listen to this show regularly know, I also take out my own culture, which does make the Turks quite mad. But I got another one of those for you today. A uh, guy is getting married down near Gaziantep in Turkey. That's actually very close to where uh, my parents uh, met and grew up. Uh, they grew up in Kilis. This guy was from another town uh, nearby, Akçagöze. Uh, getting married uh, and brings a weapon to the uh, wedding because... Some parts of Turkey, they have the tradition of, after uh, the wedding, to celebrate by shooting the gun into the air. Except this particularly bright gentleman decided to bring uh, AK-47 instead. And as he's firing into the air, he loses control of his machine gun and mows down the wedding party. Three people dead, uh, eight uh, others injured. Uh, among the people that are dead are the groom's father, so he killed his own dad, and two aunts. Literal face bomb. I mean, come on, man. And this happens in Turkey from time to time to celebrate different things, and it's gotten a little bit better now. But I remember the days when my relatives would tell me, after a big soccer game, whichever side won would go and shoot guns in the air. Except if you do that in a big city like Istanbul, there's high rises, so the bullets would fly into the air and not completely straight, and would go into the buildings. People would have to start hiding in their bathtubs because people are just sitting in their home, and all of a sudden they get shot. Okay, you don't bring an AK-47 to a wedding and try to shoot it up in the air. But but look, they might not know, but I know because once I went to a gun range, and we I shot a couple of guns. Right now. I'm for gun control in certain places and certain times, et cetera, but nearly 50% of the homes have guns. You know, I get that that's uh, something who, that's not going to change in America. But on a personal level, am I going to have a gun? I don't think so, because I think that's danger. But do I mind shooting a gun at a range? No, that sounds fun to me. So I went and did it, and we shot a bunch of different guns, and then I grabbed a machine gun. You know what happened? <laughs> well, I think I have the audio from the event. It went something like this. Oh, okay. I sh I'm like, where did it go? I don't think I hit the target, but I shot a lot. And then why is it snowing in here? And the guy who was helping me is like, no, it's not snowing. Of course, I didn't think it was snowing. It was Vegas. But I'm like, what's up with all the dust? It's because I shot it up into the air without realizing it and shot up the ceiling. And the cement was falling. <laughs> okay, maybe it's us Turks that have such bad aim. Okay, but God, that is so stupid. Yeah, look, I, the good folks in Turkey, and by the way, this is not all the Turks, and I'm, every Turk I know thinks it's the dumbest thing they've ever heard. Okay, but obviously some of them do it, right? So if you're listening to this, for the love of God, that's one part of your culture that you got to get rid of. Ixne 
on the AK-47A at your wedding end. I'm not sure the terrible pig Latin is really going to help the term. <laughs> anyway, all right, so that's your random story to start uh, this hour with. Now, let's go to some of the uh, top controversies in the country. We got the mosque, we got Prop 8, uh, et cetera. Let's start with Prop 8. So Tony Perkins, who's uh, head of the Family Research Council, um, whose main job is to discriminate against gays, uh, I've never seen them propose anything that was pro-family. Uh, the only thing I ever propose is things that are discriminatory. Well, he's at it again, and he says, oh, yeah, of course, uh, this Judge Vaughn Walker, who had the Prop 8 decision in California, who said, oh, it's unconstitutional to discriminate against gays. We hear he's a little light in the pants. First of all, that's unconfirmed. The only thing anybody has is a San Francisco Chronicle piece where they say it's an open secret that he's gay. Well, you know what that would make it? A secret. He didn't confirm it. No one's confirmed it. But anyway, who cares? Let's assume he's gay, right? So does that mean he can't rule on a gay rights case? Well, I asked the question in a blog earlier today. You can check it out at theyoungturks.com. What if there was a black justice on the Supreme Court during Brown versus Board of Education? Could he not have ruled? <laughs> well, of course you would want the same rights as white people. You're totally biased. How about Thurgood Marshall, who argued that case, who later went on to become the first African-American uh, justice? Could he not have ruled on any race case? Well, of course you're black. You were not like, but then wait a minute, can white people rule? What if California decided to take away the rights of women? And then a female justice got it, and they said, oh, no, no, you're biased. Of course you want the right to vote. Yeah, of course I do, because it's in the Constitution. That's not bias. How about straight people? Can they rule uh, on Prop 8? You know, because Prop 8 gives them a so-called advantage if you consider the monopoly on marriage an advantage, right? But a lot of people in California said, no, gay people shouldn't have the same rights as straight people. Aren't they biased? This bias argument is absurd. Absurd, I say. But of course, that's what the conservatives are hanging their hat on because they don't have any substance. They, don't have, hey, they can't say, hey, Judge Walker got this wrong. He's irrational or he's wrong on the law. He's wrong on the history, anything. All they got is, nope, 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 institution of marriage, institution of marriage, and you're gay. Ha, 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 you're gay. So you're biased, and we're not going to let you decide what kind of rights you have. Classy. Always classy with these conservatives. All right, so now that's Tony Perkins. Um, the guy who argued the case, to be fair, actually was a, uh, one of the guy, one of the top lawyers was a conservative, Ted Olson. And there, no one questions his conservative credentials, longtime conservative, uh, worked in the Bush administration, um, and he thinks it's a matter of constitutional rights. He's going to go on uh, with Fox News Channel with Chris Wallace and destroy Wallace. He's going to shred him on every single account. So this is going to be fun to watch. First, Chris Wallace comes at him about activist judges. Let's see how that turned out. Mr. Olson, let's start with the issue of judicial activism. Seven million Californians voted for Proposition 8. Seven million people voted to amend the state constitution to ban same-sex marriage. Now a single judge overrules all of them? Well, that's why we have judges. That's why we have an independent judiciary. We do not put the Bill of Rights to a vote. Forty-one states once prohibited interracial marriages uh, so that in Virginia when the Supreme Court finally struck that uh, prohibition down the president's parents could not have been married our fundamental rights the part of our constitution is a separation of powers and an independent judiciary we ask judges to make sure that when we vote for something we're not depriving minorities of their constitutional rights and that's what the judge did but as a leading conservative lawyer you have condemned such judicial activism in the past let's take a look at what you said in two thousand seven judges have taken some of those decisions off the policy table taking them away from the people by constitutionalizing these issues. Question, isn't that exactly what Judge Walker did in this case? No, as a matter of fact, since 1888, the United States Supreme Court has 14 times decided and articulated that the right to marriage is a fundamental right. We're not talking about a new right here. We're talking about whether a fundamental right, something that's, that 
the Supreme Court is characterized as the most fundamental relationship we have in this country can be deprived of certain individuals because of the color of their skin or because of their sexual orientation. We do not permit discrimination, inequality. That's why we have a 14th Amendment that guarantees equal rights to all citizens. It's not judicial activism when judges do what the Constitution requires them to do and they follow the precedent of previous decisions of the Supreme Court. Yeah, he just had Chris Wallace for breakfast. He's like, mm, yummy for my tummy. And he's just getting warmed up. By the way, Judge Walker, who made the decision, was appointed by Ronald Reagan and then later, again, by George H.W. Bush. He's a libertarian and he agrees with a lot of what Ted Olson is saying here and believes that's actually the conservative position. And uh, he tailor-made a decision, this is brilliant, for Justice Kennedy. Because Justice Kennedy has voted in favor of gay rights in the past. He's the swing vote uh, on the Supreme Court. In case this goes all the way to the Supreme Court, all over the case he quoted Kennedy again and again and again. In other words, saying to Kennedy, what are you going to do? Disagree with yourself? It's a great decision. Greatly argued by Ted Olson, he's just getting warmed up on Wallace. Let, let's, by the way, one line I loved in there is, we don't put the Bill of Rights up for a vote. All right. go, go, get, 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 get at him again, Ted. But, but uh, Mr. Olson, you have also said this, judges should, quote, interpret the law, not make it up, not create new rights that weren't there in the Constitution. Where is the right to, you've talked about the right to marriage, where is the right to same-sex marriage in the Constitution? Where is the right to interracial marriage in the Constitution, Chris? The Supreme Court has said that marriage, the right to marry a person of your choice, is a part of liberty, privacy, association, and spirituality guaranteed to each individual under the Constitution. When you say same-sex marriage, you're saying um, a particular type of marriage. The Supreme Court has looked at marriage and has said that the right to marry is a fundamental right for all citizens. So you call it interracial marriage and then you could prohibit it? No. The Supreme Court has said no. The same thing here. The judge, after hearing three weeks of testimony and a full day of closing arguments and listening to experts from all over the world, concluded that the denial of the right to marry to these individuals in California hurt them and did not advance the cause of opposite sex marriage. This is what judges are expected to do. It is not judicial activism. It is judicial uh, responsibility in its classic sense. Yeah, yeah. Chris Wallace, you're going to try to get in an argument with Ted Olson. Good luck with you. Here's what Ted Olson is. He's smart. Okay. He's like, where in the Constitution is gay marriage? So where is interracial marriage? Nope. All right, keep at them. So society doesn't get to say that marriage should be between a man and a woman, even though society has said that for thousands of years. Seven million people in California don't get to say that marriage is between a man and a woman, even though just in November of 2008, seven million Californians voted that they wanted to change their own state constitution to say just that. In the 1960s, uh, an equivalent number, it's a smaller number, but of Californians voted to change their constitution to say that you could discriminate on the basis of race in the sale of your home. The United States Supreme Court struck that down. If seven million Californians were to decide that we should have separate but equal schools, or that we would send some of our citizens to separate drinking fountains, or have them um, be in the back of the bus, that would be unconstitutional. If, if we didn't have a separation of powers, if we didn't have a Bill of Rights, then seven million Californians could take away your rights or my rights or the rights of these citizens in California. But we do have a Bill of Rights and it's intended to protect us. The 14th Amendment was the result that guarantees, uh, the 14th Amendment that guarantees due process and equal protection to all citizens, to all persons, was the result of a civil war intended to enforce the promise of our Constitution that all men and women are created equal. The judge is simply fulfilling that promise, that American promise, the leading expert on the other side 
said that we w when we stopped this discrimination, America would be more true to its ideals. That's exactly what happened here. <laughs> man, he's hammering this guy, man. I'm starting to feel bad for Chris Wallace. Chris, cut it out, man. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't keep going at him, okay? And, and by the way, you remember he mentioned the due process there in the 14th Amendment. Remember, Republicans now trying to take away the 14th Amendment. That's not just for their what birthright citizenship, as they claim. That would take away due process to take our Bill of Rights, et cetera, and apply it to all the states. That would have tremendous ramifications. It's a terrible idea. All right, we got one more for you. Let's go to clip number seven now. Ted Olson, as we said at the top of this segment, your conservative credentials are unquestioned. You argued and won Bush v. Gore, which ended up with the election of President George W. Bush. You were his first solicitor general. And a lot of people have asked me, so I want to ask you, why did you get involved in this cause? And is it in fact the case that uh, Hollywood director and liberal Rob Reiner was the one who got you to take on the case? Well, there's a lot of people that ask me to take on this case. Chris, we believe that a conservative value is stable relationships and a stable community and loving individuals coming together and forming a basis of, 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 that is a building block of our society, which includes marriage. We believe that that is a conservative value. We also believe that it's an important conservative value to sustain the rights of liberty of our citizens and to eliminate discrimination on invidious bases, whether it's race or sex or sexual orientation. It should be a liberal and a conservative value. It is a fundamental American value. All men and all women are created equal under the law. No, no, I'm having too much fun. I gotta do one more. Let's go to clip number six. Here's where some people see a comparison to the battle over abortion. The political process in the case of same-sex marriage was working. Five states in Washington, D.C. have legalized same-sex marriage. Now, instead of letting this be decided on a state-by-state -state basis, you are, in effect, pushing the courts to preempt the argument, which is exactly what they did in Roe versus Wade. Well, would you like your right to free speech? Would you like Fox's right to free press, put up to a vote, and say, mm. well, if five states have approved it, let's wait till the other 45 states do. These are fundamental constitutional rights. The Bill of Rights guarantees Fox News and you, Chris Wallace, the right to speak. It's in the Constitution. And the Supreme Court has repeatedly held that the denial of our citizens of the equal rights to equal access to justice under the law is a violation of our fundamental rights. Yes, it's encouraging that many states are moving towards equality on the basis of sexual er uh, orientation. And I am very, very pleased about that because it is extraordinarily damaging to our citizens, our family members, our brothers, our sisters, our co-workers, and our neighbors when they are labeled second-class citizens. When the state of California, as it did in this case, enshrined in its constitution a separate status for certain of its citizens, it did immeasurable harm. We can't wait for the voters to decide that that immeasurable harm that is unconstitutional must finally be eliminated. I applaud the fact that things are changing, and I think this case is helping open people's eyes to the damage done by discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Uh, uh, All we have to do is look into the eyes of these individuals and decide why are we de denying them the right to have happiness that we accord to all of our other citizens. Okay, Chris, here's what he had for you, a tall glass of shut up juice. He said, look, look, look you want to debate whether the state should be allowed to ban Fox News and not give you your freedom of speech? That's in the Bill of Rights. You want, you want to do it? You want to do it? Whoa, sick dead. <laughs> oh, come on, man. He busts you up eight ways to Sunday. Now you just scat. Get. Get. He rough talk you and run you off. That was great stuff. All right, we'll be right back.